have at it. <laughs> Good morning. Scripture comes from Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to trip and fall into sin must happen, but how, ter but how terrible it is for the person through whom they happen. It would be better for them to be thrown into a lake with a large stone hung around their necks than to cause one of these little ones to trip and fall into sin. Watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sin, warn them to stop. If they change their hearts and lives, forgive them. Even if someone sins against you seven times in one day and returns to you seven times and says, I am changing my ways, you must forgive that person. This is God's word for God's people. Amen. Thank you, Becky. I think you stole my paper, but it ha it happens. It's not. Yep, it, it happens. It happens. Yep, because yours is you're there. Yours is in there. Not that I need it, but because I kind of know what goes on next. But I don't know that I re remember the the hymn that comes next. That would be the thing that would bother me the most. So, how was your first full week of uh, 2021? <laughs> I think when we all were like hoping that 2020 would be done and be gone, it, it uh, uh, not a lot changed. <laughs> not a lot got different. I hope that you were able to think about uh, last week's message, that this you know, new theme of the year is starting to ring. Um, it's new and it's fresh and it's not old. Uh, I hope that we don't forget that we're still to be rooted, growing, and spreading, but that our personal relationship is, is the focus, and, and that renewal and that uh, repentance, refreshment, and restoration is happening within us, hopefully uh, on a daily basis if possible. It's all a part of a, a spiritual journey that every one of us is on, and we're not all in the same place. And it's going to be a little bit more difficult. This, this theme is a, a little bit meatier. Right? You might need a knife and fork for this one. This isn't the low-hanging fruit that we've done the past few years. Today I wanted to focus on the word repent. And the text that I chose, and I'll tell you what the reason why I chose that text. Number one, it talks about someone coming to you as, in repentance, asking for forgiveness, and then that we should forgive them, right? And that comes from Jesus himself. Now, the reason I chose that text is there's, there's two things that are happening here. One, someone else is asking for repentance from, and, and asking for forgiveness from us. But then also that Jesus uses the same word repent, that same Greek that we found last week, which is metanoeo. Metanoeo is the same repent that is used here in this text in Luke. And it's also the same one from the book of Acts. So these words are used in the same context. So when we are asking of ourselves to repent, Jesus is also saying in this moment that there are people who will come to you and repent. Right? Now, what happens here in this text is we find that this word really means to change your mind. I love the, the, the version that, that Becky read because it didn't use the word repent, did it? It used the word when someone comes to you and changes their ways. Something, I think that was it. <laughs> Paraphrase. Trying to remember what I heard 10 seconds ago, right? The question for us today, <clears throat> and I hope that you think about this as we walk through this this morning, and we talk about these texts kind of side by side, even pull another, I'll pull, I'll pull in some Mark 1 for you too. Um, how can this move us into a new relationship with God? Uh, like, like maybe we feel like this relationship that we're having with God is kind of stale. Um, it's kind of boring. Uh, I don't get anything out of it, right? How many of us have thought that? Especially now in this type of season? 
And so how, how can this happen? The other thing I want you to think about, and, and you'll find out at the end, how many times a day do you think you wash your hands? Okay, pre, let's go back to 2019, how many times a day did you wash your hands? <laughs> Once. <laughs> I know I've got some uh, teenagers and soon-to-be teenagers in my house that I'm not sure if they do wash their hands. That's another discussion for another day. But today's text starts off, and, and I loved it, the way that we picked this up in, in verses 1 through 3. And it basically says, one day Jesus said to his disciples. And so we get this perfect introduction to Jesus telling them something, which probably means he's telling us something, right? There will always be temptations to sin, but the, what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? It would be better to be thrown into the sea with a millstone hung around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. So watch yourselves. Now this is taking that whole uh, repentance piece, right? This whole temptation part and twisting it back a little bit. It's not about us being tempted, but now us quite possibly being the tempter, which is going to be a problem because that's something that we might need to repent from. Jesus reminds us in this opening text that we're all going to be tempted. There are temptations for each of us every day. And because we're unique, and because we're individuals, they look different. Not all of you are so tempted by pizza like I am. Seriously, I can't. I, it's there. I've got to eat it. I'm sorry. And then I don't like myself because I, eat, I don't feel good. <laughs> Some of us, it, it's so much easier, and it's not always that the devil is not going to, to blatantly, obviously tempt you. Right? He's not going to, to, to say, okay, here's a million dollars. You just got to kill that person. That would be a blatant, obvious, okay, no, I can't do that. Some people, it wouldn't be so blatant and obvious, but it's not about the blatant and obvious many, many times for him. Maybe uh, we, are, we are sleeping in when really our, our time could be spent uh, waking up a little bit earlier, having a little bit more time with God, understanding him a little bit more. Maybe we are, are justifying uh, our lack of help for somebody because of who they are and how we view their actions. Maybe, uh, for whatever reason, we, we, put our, we put others so far ahead of ourselves because we think that's what we're supposed to do and we're extending ourselves so much that we're actually causing damage to ourselves physically, mentally, and emotionally. See, we all have our temptations, but Satan is not. He's not always going to be obvious imagine if you will the garden of eden right he didn't just tell eve oh it's good don't worry about it i know it's really going to be bad but it's okay he actually talked her into it hey i would eat it well we were told not to well, come on. He's God. He's not going to kill you. Why would he do a thing like that? Come on, you can do it. He did, oh, now see, God just doesn't want you to be as smart as he is. You're fine. And so in all of this, we have to understand that being on guard and watching ourselves is not just for us, but it's also for the people around us. What are we portraying? What are we showing people? Are we causing other people to stumble because of our actions? That's part of our daily repentance. We should be cautious. Cautious about what we're saying, especially on social media. Cautious about what we're doing. Cautious of asking someone else to do something because if we're going to ask of somebody else to do something or to be something, then we've got to make sure that we're being that and doing that too. In verse 3 and 4, he says, 
Jesus gives us an idea of what happens after the fact. So we, we see somebody who's in sin. And, and I notice the word in, in my uh, New Living Translation text was rebuke. And I noticed that Becky's word was warn them. We, we take that word rebuke and we want to make that like a physical rebuke, right? We want that to be, oh, you're bad, beat with a switch kind of rebuke, right? In our minds, that's the way it should be. Filthy sinner, right? And so what, depending upon how you read that, when, when Becky read it through her text, I get the concept and the idea that, that Jesus is saying, if somebody is sinning, warn them. Hey, you know what? You may not want to be doing that. That might not work out the way that you think. That might not be the best way to, to help your relationship with, with a God that you may or may not believe in. Jesus uses the word repentance here, though. And that's that same word, metaneo, metanoeo. In that person, after you've come to them, after you've had that bonding experience and you've warned them and you've rebuked them, he's talking about when they change their ways, when they turn around and do something completely different, forgive them. And I know it's hard. Somebody comes to us seeking forgiveness, and, and, and this repentance word is that same word. We've got to understand that the forgiving happens when they're turning the other way, right? This forgiving word doesn't have to happen <laughs> if they're mocking you and going to do it again. <laughs> There's a repentance tied to the forgiveness, right? Jesus does it with us. We don't really get that forgiveness until we ask for it, until we're real with it, and then it changes our lives. In Mark uh, 1, 4, John the Baptist, right? Crazy John the Baptist, homeless guy out in the wilderness eating bugs and stuff. He's in the river baptizing people. And he's baptizing people with a special message. Today is the day that we celebrate the baptism of Jesus. And so what is the message that John is using? He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. He uses a very similar word. He didn't use metanoeo because of the, the tech, the, the, yeah, mm-hmm. The, the tense, if you will, he used metanoias, which has the same meaning as the other word repentance that, and repent that we find in Acts 3 and Luke 17. So here's John the Baptist baptizing people. And what happens as he's doing this? Jesus comes and he steps forward. And John knows who he is. And he's like, oh, man. I am not worthy to do this. And he's like, but you have to. So he baptizes Jesus. And it's the beginning of Jesus' ministry here on earth. Holy Spirit comes upon him. God speaks to the people that were standing there. And it starts something. There's always an act of repentance that is a turning away from it, but it's also the beginning of something else, typically. Repentance is the act of turning away from that thing in your life which is separating you from God. It's fairly simple. Uh, I said this last week, but your first act of repentance was the moment that you realized that Jesus saved you and there was nothing that you could do about it on your own. And so you had to accept this forgiveness you had to embody this, you had to be filled with this, and you had to turn and go the other way. There was nothing that you could do, so you trusted him. You reached out to him, and you asked him to forgive you, and you began to change. How many of you accepted Christ, and life has been perfect and wonderful and roses and puppy dogs ever since? Show of hands. Anybody, anybody want to show hands? Hmm. 
It's crazy because I can't think of any person within Scripture who actually knew, admitted, and found this Jesus, and their life was perfect. In fact, what we see is something completely different because the world doesn't want you to have that relationship with God. The world is constantly trying to get you to eat the darn apple. And that's not what God wants for you. It's not that he wants you to be miserable. He doesn't. But what he wants you to understand is that in the midst of this turmoil, in the midst of this conflict, you are the winner. It might hurt now, but now is a tiny little blip on this eternal timeline. The rest of our lives, we are going to face temptations. We are going to sin. We are going to fall short. Daily repentance is not the the heresitical version, which I'm saying we have to repent daily to be saved. No, we have to repent daily so that God can forgive us of the mistakes we made and we can grow from that together. He'll give us forgiveness. He'll show us a better way. He'll lead us in a new path. It's noticeable mostly by our willingness to confess things to God that we may or may not think is bad. That's the hardest part. If we are not having that conversational relationship with God, how does he know how you feel? How does he know what you believe? How does he know that you're maybe falling short a little bit? It's all part of the conversation. It's all part of the relationship. It's part of the growth. How many of you have earthly relationships and a lot of times you don't want to but you've got to admit a fault or a failure to somebody and ask them for forgiveness. It's hard, isn't it? It's not very easy. It should, hopefully, it should be even easier with God because we know that he loves us. He's not going to condemn us. And we don't even have to see him face-to-face physically, right? We don't have to work next to him tomorrow. So why is it harder for us to do that with God than it is with anybody else? Not that it's easy to do it with people, because that's pretty hard too. Is it because we're afraid? Is it because we're worried? I asked you a question earlier about how many times you wash your hands every day, right? Well, why in the world would you wash your hands? Well, I might have stuff on them. I might have germs, junk, dirt. I don't really want to eat that. So I wash my hands. It's amazing how in the middle of uh, this virus, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, we've gotten into the habit of washing our hands more. Even though we realize that we should be doing that even regardless of there's a pandemic going on. But because of it being so firm and fresh in our minds, We wash our hands. We simply are removing the dirt that we gather from the hands doing what the hands do, right? Touch stuff. They touch stuff. They shake. They fist bump. They grab things off the store shelf. All of those things are like our souls. They are contaminating. We live in a world that constantly wants to contaminate us. Constantly through our eyes, through our ears, through our hearts. And so how do we, I don't have a sink that I can go to wash my heart or my eyes or my soul in. My wife and I have uh, really gotten into a little house on the prairie. I don't know why, because I remember as a kid not really liking it at all. And I understand why now as an adult, why as a kid, I didn't like it. But as an adult, every episode I'm watching, there is this incredible message, whether it's about racism, whether it's about government control, whether it's about the the ability to love your neighbor, whether it's about bullying. And you're talking about a show that was long before these were buzzwords in our ears. And yet these are still true. 
one of the things, and it's almost every episode, almost, Charles has worked all day. He's been in the field. He's been in the stalls. He's been at the mill. He's worked all day. And he comes in, and one of the first things he does is he goes to the basin, and he washes his hands, he pours out a little water, and he washes his face, and he cleans himself up a little bit. Because he knows what his hands have been through that day, and he knows that I've really got to clean these hands if I don't want to contaminate the rest of my family and my food. How many of you need to wash your hands today? And by wash your hands, I mean wash your soul. How many of us know that there is something in our lives that is keeping us from experiencing God in that oh my goodness way that we miss? If you're missing it, if you're missing it, maybe there's a daily simple washing of the soul that could be very helpful to to repairing that relationship with God. Something that can give you hope. Something that can stir within you the celebration of being known by him. Today we celebrate the baptism of Jesus and we visualize this water. This water that was not only cleansing for the physical person, which is that outward expression that God has cleansed me, but the water that is good for cleansing and washing. And it's what we wash our hands with, right? It's how we wash and clean that relationship that we have with God. I pray today that you are willing to see repentance as a way of helping you wash your soul. It doesn't have to be dramatic. It doesn't have to be an altar call. It can just be a moment sitting in your car, waiting to go into that job you hate, and just letting go. God, this is where I'm failing. And I really need your help. I hope and I pray that you find repentance as a good thing, like washing your hands, that'll help you today. Amen.